Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, turn in our Bible over to Genesis chapter 1. Boy, there's a novel place to begin, huh? Begin at the beginning. Begin at the beginning. I felt seeing it's Mother's Day, a little family humor would be in order today, uh, particularly having to do with marriage. Uh, one newly married and then a couple that's been married for some time. First, the newly married. A recently married man was walking with his father one day and said, my new wife's cooking is so bad, we pray after we eat. <laughs> Don't say it to her. That's all I can tell you. Don't say it to her. There's no telling what you'll get in your food. All right? And then sometimes... Uh, as time moves on, we don't realize that we are the problem. And uh, one older man said, Doctor, I think my wife is getting hard of hearing. Doctor said, I'll have my nurse make an appointment for her, but in the meantime, there's a simple and formal test you can run to give us an idea of how bad the problem is. Uh, here's what you do. Start out about 40 feet away from her, and in a normal conversational speaking tone, say something and see if she hears you. If not, then go to 30 feet, and if not, then 20 feet, and so on, until you get a response. Well, that evening, the wife was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and he's in the living room. In a normal tone, he asks, Honey, what's for supper? No response. So the husband moves to the other end of the room and repeats, Honey, What's for supper? Still no response. Next, he moves into the dining room. Honey, what's for supper? No response. So he walks up to the kitchen door. Honey, what's for supper? And again, no response. So he walks right up behind her. Honey, what's for supper? For the fifth time, Harry, chicken. You know, sometimes we don't realize we're the problem, right? And this is one of the great challenges of married life, is that uh, not only as you progress on in marriage, you start learning your spouse and how they are and, and uh, all the uh, adjustments. You know, I, you've heard me say many times, life is a series of adjustments. Well, marriage is a series of adjustments as well. But, uh, you know, we not only learn about our spouse, we also learn about us, right? And uh, if you're not learning about you as you continue on in your marriage, uh, let me say that uh, you are a problem because um, uh, we need to be learning about our stuff. Now, no one understands the inner workings of something better than the one who created it. Uh, you take, for an example, a good architect. Now, you notice I emphasize good. All right? A good architect designs a building. He understands about load-bearing walls. He understands about traffic flow in a building. He understands the different necessities of light and, and so forth. All the things, outlets, all the things that are necessary for a good building to be a good building. And if indeed that building gets built and it is a great structure and it's a good building, that's going to be a blessing and an encouragement and a benefit of people down through the decades, okay? Down through the decades. Um, uh, and, and why is that? Well, because somebody knew what they were doing when they designed it. They knew what they were doing. And can I say today, without apology, that the family is God's creation. The family is God's idea, all right? There were no human beings before God created them, and when he created them, he created them and he had a plan for the family. Now, if it is a real family, it, is, it, it ought to be following God's plan because he is the architect, he's the designer. You can't do it better than, than he can. And so today we're going to be talking about understanding God's plan for your family. All right? And this is, um, this is going to be a two-part series. Now, <clears throat> when God created us, he created us, male and female. The first two people ever made, one was a male, the other was a female. And you might say, are you kidding me? I mean, everybody knows that, right? 
No. As a matter of fact, uh, if, if you uh, were raised in evolution, okay, um, you don't see it as God sees it because uh, you don't see the uniqueness of the marriage relationship. You don't see the uniqueness and the exclusiveness of male versus female or male together with female, so to speak. Um, evolution teaches that it just all evolved and it's just, uh, it just happened that way and all that. No, God had a complete design for it. He's the architect. He's the maker in all of this. And when he created us, he created us male and female. And he was very clear about how they were to relate to one another. He then gave us instructions on what a family is and how it is to function. All right? And so the first thing we're going to look at, and this is what we're going to look at today, is we're going to look at the issue of marriage. Now, I could do a long series on this, and we have done that many times before, but I'm just giving you a very brief overview on this today to where we all get an understanding, yes, this is, this is what God is thinking as far as my marriage. Now, you might say, well, you know what, but I'm married, and, and, and what does it matter? Well, I'll tell you what it matters, dear friend. How, do you, how would you like your marriage to be a blessing? Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like your marriage to be blessed by God, to there be harmony in your marriage, to there be harmony in your home? Uh, I think everybody would like that. Now, the opposite of that is, is uh, friction and tension and misery. Misery. I think everybody would say, you know what, I'd like things good. Yeah, I would too. And those to, to get that the way it should be is found in the plan of the architect, okay? Use it, do it the way God intended it to be because that's where the blessing is. Everything works better when we do it God's way. Everything works better. And so let's, let's first of all, in this issue of marriage, first understand the distinction. The distinction, okay? He created them male and female. Genesis chapter 1, in verse 27, it says this, For So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Look at this. Male and female created he them. Okay? Male and female created he them. Now jump over to chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. Now, chapter 1 is general, okay? And in chapter 2, you, you get some specifics in this. Chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him, or a helper, some would say. All right? From the Bible, we see three vital truths having to do with marriage. I wish I could talk about each one of these at length today, but we don't have time. But they are simply this, folks. You wonder, what is marriage about? And by the way, we are talking about marriage. We're not talking about living together. All right? Living together, the Bible has a name for that. It's called fornication. All right? Uh, no, we are talking about marriage. Marriage. And what is marriage? Well, according to the Bible, marriage, I believe there's, there's three aspects to it. First, it is for intimate companionship. You notice the first thing God said, it is not good for man to be alone, all right? It is for intimate companionship. Secondly, it's for procreation, procreation. And third, it is for training the future generations of the human race for Jesus Christ, okay? Not just having children, no, God has a reason to have children. It is to train the next generation, future generations, for Jesus Christ. And that includes leading them to the Lord, and that, is, that includes discipling them in the ways and principles of God. By the way, marriage is one man and one woman. All right? Look at, we're in chapter 2, look at verse 21. Genesis 2.21, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, God took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Or I would imagine when Adam saw Eve, he probably said, she shall be called 
whoa, man, you know. Um, that hyphen is in the Hebrew. You can't see it in it. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, she shall be called woman. You'll never read that the same, by the way. Because she was taken out of man. Therefore, therefore, you notice that? Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. God is the designer, again, and he made them male and female. He did not design them male and male. He did not design them female and female. Okay? To, to hijack the term marriage and apply that to a, uh, a homosexual relationship is perverting the plan of God. It is twisting it. It is distorting it into something that God never intended. If he had intended that, he would have made them that way. But that is not the way he made them. He, did, he, he designed them male and male. It would be impossible for the human race to continue procreation, part of God's plan. It would be impossible for the human race to continue if all there were were homosexuals. Okay? God says that is a distortion of his way. Now, I know there are people who hear this and they'll say, well, that's hate speech, that's hate speech. Dear friend, number one, be quiet and be reasonable, okay? I guess that's two things. The Lord spoke this before anyone came up with the idea of hate speech, right? Because someone disagrees with you does not qualify it as hate speech, okay? Let's get over this once and for all, okay? And let's start telling people that, and let's start stopping them. They say, oh, you're, you're into hate speech. No, why, why is it hate speech? Because I disagree with you, it's hate speech, okay? That is an ignorant idea. We ought to be able to disagree with each other and not hate one another. Okay? There, are, there are lots of people who disagree with me. Do I hate them? I don't hate them at all. I don't hate them. And depending upon what it is, if it's something very important, if it's a biblical thing and they disagree with me, I feel sorry for them. I don't hate them. Why? Well, because they, they are going to suffer the results of their uh, disagreement or their unbelief to the Word of God. No hate involved. And so if, if, if I don't hate you, then why would you hate me? If I don't have hostility and hatred towards you, then why would you have hostility hatred towards me? Sounds to me like you're the one with the problem. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Now people say, well, well, yeah, but wait a minute. Have you been living, have you had your head in the sand? Have you been living in a cave or something the last few years? I mean, don't you know that the Supreme Court legalize this and that it's okay and all these kind of things? No, wait a minute, friends. The Supreme Court is not supreme. God is supreme. Remember, he's the one who made us. God is the creator of the world and of people. He's given us his word to tell us what is right, what is wrong. And, and he is the one, he is the one who gives us the standard. And if the, if the uh, Supreme Court says, well, uh, yeah, that can, be, that can be this, and it disagrees with God, the Supreme Court is wrong. By the way, they're not divine. They're not perfect. They're not omniscient. They're not all wise. And by the way, that becomes more evident as time goes on, doesn't it? By the things that they decide. Absolute foolishness, a lot of what they're deciding. This is kind of a, this is not in the notes, and I better say it quickly so I don't take up too much time with this. My wife and I have been watching a commentary series, or a documentary series, I should say, on the 60s, it was put out by uh, CNN. Yeah, I know, they're very liberal-leaning and so forth. But still, it's been an interesting one, watching this in the 60s. And as we're watching it, it's, I don't know, what is it, a 10-part series or something like that? As we're watching this documentary series, of course, I grew up in the 60s. 
And, uh, you know, I went through all of that, and I had awareness as the, uh, probably from about the mid-60s on, I started being aware because I was still a little kid before that. Um, but, you know, I was in high school and graduating at the end of the 60s and the hippie movement and all the kind of things. Fascinating, folks. Listen, our nation has never changed so much as it did in the 60s. Okay? And, and by the way, adults, and I would recommend adults, if you're going to watch that, you watch that. Don't watch it with your little kids, okay? But the things that took place in the 60s in this country... And don't you think it's interesting? Don't you think it's interesting that early in the 60s, prayer and the Bible were kicked out of the public school? And I don't say this in a vulgar way, but literally all hell broke loose in America. Could it be that God immediately started pouring out judgment on this nation? Could it be? Now, I know the seeds of that were in the 50s. I know the seeds of that actually went back decades. But still, that was kind of a, uh, a, a turning moment, don't you think? When, when the, the, uh, the, the court said, you know what, God? Neither you talking to you or your opinion is no longer welcome in our public school system. Okay. Have your way. And folks, we've got a mess on our hands in case you haven't noticed it. We've got a mess on our hands today. Very interesting. That just kind of popped right out. And they didn't mention that, of course, during this uh, CNN series, documentary series. But it's very interesting that, uh, you, you, you know, that they don't put that in there. But it was such a pivotal point in our nation's history and what took place after that. Romans 1.26, for this cause, for this cause, okay, what, what cause? Turning their back on God, man turning his back on God. It says, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that, notice this, which is against nature. In other words, against the way God made them. They chose a way that was contrary to the way that God made them. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly or unfitting, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. The wages of sin is still death. Not only eternally, but temporally, physically. Folks, it is an absolute known fact. We see today that the average homosexual dies 10 to 20 years earlier than someone who is not. 10 to 20 years is taken off the life. By the way, there are verses in Proverbs that are very clear on the principle that we see here. Simply this, we do reap what we sow. And we can thumb our, you know, thumb our noses at God and we can curse him and we can mock him and we can make fun of him. And you know what? It's not going to change anything. Friend, listen. God loves everyone and he wants everybody to be saved and he wants everybody to be his child and he doesn't want anybody to end up in hell. He wants everybody to end up in heaven. Everybody. And he's provided that through his son. We'll get to that in just a couple, couple minutes. But we see this, okay? We see this very clearly. Now, uh, back in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, it says this, And God blessed them, who's the them? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. God blessed marriage. Okay? And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, procreation, and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so we see God is the one that he set up a distinction. When we talk about marriage, there's a distinction. And listen, when men act like women and women act like men, it only causes problems. Men need to be men. And God is the one who, by the way, 
defines that and gives us the character traits. Women need to be women, and God is the one, by the way, who defines that and gives the character traits of what he's talking about. And as long as men strive by the grace of God to be men and women strive by the grace of God to be women, you know what? There is going to be a, a, a beauty in that, something that is honorable in that, that God can bless. And so with that in mind, we, we, we talked about understanding the distinction. Now let's talk about understanding the roles. Okay, and when I say roles, I'm not talking about cinnamon and sweet. Okay, um, look at Ephesians chapter 5. Your mission in this, your role in this thing we call marriage. Can I tell you this, folks? If... If the Lord wasn't planning on being in the middle of every marriage, marriage is a stupid idea. It really is. If you have a marriage where Christ is not central, you're asking for serious problems. You really are. Why? Number one, that's not the way God designed it. He, he designed it to, for him to be in the middle of it. Not only that, but you know what? According to the word of God, marriage, marriage needs to have the Lord in the middle of it because we need his power and ability and wisdom to be a good spouse. You can't do it on your own. You just can't. Not the way God intended it. Understanding the roles. That's why it says in Ephesians 5, you might say, oh, I know where he's going. He's going to verse 22. Not yet. We'll get there in a second. Ephesians 5, verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be under the control of the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with, uh, and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, notice Verse 18 is before verse 21. If you took out verses 19 and 20 for just a minute, it would read this way. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, submitting yourselves, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You notice in marriage, it's, it's the husband's to be submission, submissive to his wife. I'll explain that in just a minute. And the wife is to be in submission to her husband. Now, what in the world does that mean? When we talk about submission, it's not so much person to person. It is first and foremost submission to God and his plan for you. Submission to God and his role for you and for me in the marriage relationship. Okay? This is what it's talking about. Now, God is a specific plan for the wife, and God has a specific plan for the husband, and they are not to cross over, and they're, they're, you're not supposed to be uh, reversing roles in this. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. We see, number one, a wife is to submit to her husband. Now, the word submit, it means to place under, to yield, to be under obedience. You know, I am amazed. I, I mean, the mind starts racing and starts going all over the place. I will read commentators on this, and they will do all they can. And these guys are much more learned than I am in, in maybe the Greek and Hebrew and so forth, Aramaic. They'll do all they can to sidestep the definition here and say, well, it doesn't mean that, though. What it means is this and that. And I'm wondering, do you have a disgruntled wife watching over your shoulder as you write this commentary? And you're afraid to just let the scriptures be the scriptures? Okay? Folks, the word submit, that word is not only used about marriage in the New Testament. It's used about many different relationships and situations. And the meaning of the word never changes. There's a context to it, yes, but the meaning never changes. Okay? A wife is to submit to her husband. She is to yield to him. She is to be under 
obedience. She is to follow him, listen, by faith in God's principle. Okay? She is to follow her husband by faith in God's principle. You notice that I didn't say by faith in him. Because he may fail. He may be a poor husband. He may be a poor leader. He may be a very unreasonable man. But the principle is there, and God's principles are always given so that we can have God's blessing and that we can have order in the home. Any creature with two heads is a monster. Now, I know there are some people who are not going to like this. They're not going to like hearing it. They're not going to like watching it on the internet, but as one man once said, if I'm rubbing your fur the wrong way, then turn the cat around. Um, God's word is God's word, folks. You can't improve on it. See, that's getting back to the architect idea. He's the one who designed it. He knows what's best. We need to believe him instead of saying, well, brother, here's that Puritan, ancient, primitive mindset, you know, cavemen and all this kind of stuff. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who ever said anything about cavemen? By the way, we do have cavemen today. They're simply men who live in caves. That's all a caveman is. Well, no, I'm talking about Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon man and Piltdown man and all this. Let me tell you something. It's all made up. God says when he created man, man was an intelligent being. Adam and Eve were not stupid. Adam and Eve were not, you know, Adam didn't walk around like, "Mm, like this. Can I tell you, folks, Adam and Eve were the prototypes for the human race. Now, they messed up because God created them with free will. But nevertheless, they were not dumb. They were very bright. And you go back in ancient civilizations, and you know what? We see things today. This ancient civilization, it lived in such and such a time in history, and and a lot of these things we do know, these ancient civilizations. Look at the amazing things they did in all this. Of course, your evolutionists can't take that because they figured if they go back that far, they had to be, you know, knuckle-draggers. And so so they they look at that, and, uh, you know, you say to somebody back then, how do you like your steak? Raw, not rare or medium or they'd just say raw that's what they think no listen it wasn't that way but anyways you go back to these ancient civilizations and you see these magnificent things that they did and the mathematics and the physics and everything that was involved and you say does that look primitive to you you know what the answer is that today well, those are space beings, aliens who visited us many thousands years ago. And, and that's not man, that was the aliens who were here. Who, by the way, planted those primitive seeds of mankind. Are you kidding me? Do you really believe that? You've been reading too many comic books. Okay? No, it's just as God says. It's just as God says. Can't make a mistake. Now, she is to follow him by faith in God's principle. Listen. It is not based or controlled by emotion, but by faith in God's word. See, God has appointed the man to be the head of the home. Now, that doesn't mean a tyrant. More about that in a minute. This doesn't mean that a husband, by the way, will always be right. And it doesn't mean that a husband will not make mistakes. Wives are not always right, and wives make mistakes also, right? That's why one of the key issues in marriage, by the way, is forgiveness. Because you're married to a sinner. No amens? Anyways, let's move on. (laughs) Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Boy, that's a, that's just a, that's powerful. That's pretty straightforward, okay? But look at verse uh, 23. 24, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in every thing. The word every means all, any, every, or the whole, the whole thing. In other words, it's, it's, it's complete in everything, in everything. What are you saying? Are you saying that 
that I'm stupid and I don't have a brain of my own. And by the way, in that series I told you about, one of the things they cover is the uh, women's liberation movement. Really quite interesting. Anyways, as far as getting back to you, what are you saying? Did I say that? I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Truth of it is, women are very intelligent. Very intelligent. And there are times when some women are more intelligent than men. There's no question about that. But folks, that's not the issue. The issue is how has God designed it? Do we want the blessings of God or not? Go with God's plan. It, it, it works out best, okay? Now, by the way, does this mean that she is not a partner? No. She is to be a helper to her husband. You know what that means? That means a man needs to be open to his wife because there are times when a wife can see something a husband can't and they are to go through life together as a couple, as, as partners, okay, in life. But ultimately, it's the man's decision on things. He is to lead, lovingly lead, but he is to lead. Does it mean that things are not discussed? No. But the husband has the final responsibility for decisions. And can I say this? It isn't just because I so fr say so, friend. He is accountable to God to make the right decisions for his marriage and for his home. Guys, do you hear that? You are accountable to God. I am accountable to God to make the right decisions for my marriage and my home. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ in heaven... I will give an account on what kind of a husband, what kind of a dad I was. Make no mistake about it. I'd say, well, I, you know, I, I didn't have a role model growing up and all that. Yeah, but you know what? We've got God as our Father. We've got the Word of God as our instruction manual. And we've got the Holy Spirit as our power. And we have a new nature to carry it out. Next excuse. See, there aren't any. God wants us to be successful. Can I tell you that? He's in our corner, and he's for us. We're his children. You know, we should be for our children, right? God's for his children. He wants them to be blessed. Look at verse 25, though. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So understanding the roles, number one, a wife is to submit to her husband. Number two, a husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. Okay? While it is true that no man will ever completely fulfill this, it is also true that we are still commanded to do it. It's a lifelong goal. It's a lifelong project. Naturally speaking, it is impossible this is another reason why we as believers are commanded to be filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit, as we saw up in verse 18. That's why that's before the passage on marriage. By the way, Ephesians 5 being the main passage in marriage, the details in the Bible. Before we could ever be what we should be, we need to be filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, you notice it says, husbands, love your wives, okay? The word love here, agape or agapeo. This is the highest form of love. And by the way, I don't usually get into this, but it is very important here in this verse. This, this is, when it says, love your wife, it's, it's a verb. It's an action word. And it is written in the present tense. It's the active voice, and it is in the imperative mood. Two things I want to focus on there. One is the present tense, and the other is the imperative mood, okay? What does that mean? Well, let me give it to you. A husband is to love his wife, number one, in obedience to God's command. That's the imperative mood. You know what that means? Let me, let me, let me give you the application. It means it's not, uh, it's not um, reactionary to how the wife is towards us. Now, listen, if a wife doesn't respect her husband, and if a husband doesn't love his wife, there's going to be a problem fulfilling those roles. It's going to be a problem. Because those are the two things. Love, husband is to love his wife, 
and she is to respect her husband. Those are the two main things in marriage. The greatest need of a wife is to be loved by her husband. The greatest need of a, of a husband is to be respected by his wife. Well, I thought man's greatest need was, no, it's respect. It's respect. All the rest comes with it. Okay. But this is the key. So it is to be in, it's in obedience to God's command. That's the imperative mood. Imperative is it's not a suggestion, it's a command. The imperative mood is, is God saying this, husbands, you love your wife. That's the imperative. If it was suggestive, it would be husbands, Kind of a nice thing if it ever occurs to you. It'd be a good thing to do if you might consider loving your wife. You get around to that, or it's a good thing. You know, if you ever think about it, maybe do that. No. God says, I'm not playing with you on this. You love your wife. Now, you might say, wait a minute. That sure doesn't sound like Valentine's Day. No, because, listen... Love is not defined by Hallmark, it's defined by God. And while emotions certainly are involved, emotions follow the absolutes found in Scripture, the principles found in Scripture. Under this, though, you notice it's in the present tense. What does that mean? It means at all times. Okay? Husbands, love your wife now, today, later today, Tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, a lifetime from now. Never stop loving your wife. Love her all the time, every day. Now, chances are, if a husband is loving his wife that way, she's going to have an easier time respecting him. Now, if he's not loving her, that doesn't mean she's off the hook. She doesn't need to respect him. No. That's the same as if a, if a wife is not respecting her husband, that doesn't give him a reason to not love her. How are we going to make progress if we forsake the role God has given us? You can't. You can't. And seeing the husband's supposed to be the leader, then he needs to lead. He needs to lead. Saying, you know what? Maybe my wife isn't perfect at respecting me the way I need to be respected. But you know what? I'm going to take the lead. I'm going to break the stalemate here, and I am going to love her like God says I'm supposed to love her. And I'm going to trust God's word to work this out. And by the way, folks, that's how things come back together if you're having marriage problems. This means we are supposed to be giving of ourselves constantly to our wives and treating them right. And then I see in this, he is to do it sacrificially. Sacrificially. Where do I get that? In the phrase, as Christ gave himself for the church. Or, excuse me, it says, um, uh, Ephesians 5. Let's see. I lost my way. Oh, here we go. Ephesians 5, where it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He sacrificed himself for her, for the church. Okay, the church is called the bride of Christ. What we see in what Jesus did for the church and what he's doing for the church is the perfect picture of the way marriage is supposed to be. Okay? Man's taking the lead. Jesus is the head of the church. Okay? He's to love. In the imperative, Jesus loves us all the time, no matter what. No, all the time, no matter what. He loves us every moment of every day, and he loves us sacrificially. How do we know Jesus loves us sacrificially? Because of what he did on the cross, okay? Agape love is the highest form of love and describes God himself. His love for us is sacrificial. It is constant. It is like electricity. It is always on, okay? It is always, well, it's supposed to be always on, but God's love is always on. 
It says that Christ loved the church and gave himself, okay? Uh, gave, it means to surrender, to yield up, right? And again, it's seen in the gospel. Hold your place here and look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> And it says in verse 9, In this was manifested the love of God towards us. Okay, uh, How much does God love us? And how, how does God love us? How do we know God loves us? In this was manifested, displayed, made known, the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Here in his love. You want to know what it's like? Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the satisfactory payment for our sins. Dear friend, listen. We come into this world as sinners, all right? Look up here. This hand representing you and me and my wallet representing our sin. We are sinners. We are flawed. We are imperfect. But the Bible says this, yes, God hates our sin, but he loves us. How much? Completely. Always. Every day. Never stopping. Or what if we're not nice to him? He still loves us. Guys, are we hearing that? Unconditional. God loves us, hates our sin, but loves us. Our sin separates us from God. To go to heaven, you've got to be perfect, and none of us are. We're all sinners. We're flawed. By the way, that's why good works will not get you to heaven, because you have to be sinless to get into heaven. We're already sinners. So you could take a whole lifetime of good works and pile it on top of your sin. It doesn't take away the sin. The sin has to be gone for us to go to heaven. If we pay for our sin, and it does have to be paid for, We'd spend forever separated from God in hell. But God loves us, hates our sin. He proved his love towards us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. This hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came and when he died on the cross, he took all of our sin upon himself, made the payment as our substitute. He was willing to die for us. How much does he love us? He died for us. That's how much he means. Sacrificed his entire life was buried, came back from the dead. And the Bible says if we will put our faith in Christ, he'll give us eternal life. See, the payment Jesus made is what's called a propitiation, as we just saw. It means a satisfactory payment. God the Father satisfied with the payment Jesus made for our sins. He had none of his own. He paid for our sins. So why would he do that? Love. Love. For God so loved the world. Look at that, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, love gives. Guys, do we hear it? Love gives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All you can do to go to heaven is to believe in Christ as your Savior. That means you put your faith in him to save you, to give you eternal life. He will save you if you believe that when he died on the cross, he paid for all your sins. You're trusting in him that the payment he made for your sins is good on your behalf. You're putting your faith in him as your way to heaven. And when you trust in him, he gives you everlasting life that moment. Isn't it the saddest thing you've ever heard that people end up going to hell in spite of the fact that God loved them? People say, I can't believe in a God who sends people to hell. God sends no one to hell. God sends no one to hell. Heaven has been bought and paid for by God the Son, Jesus Christ. He suffered for us so that we don't have to suffer at all. And he offers us everlasting life in heaven as a free gift. It couldn't get any easier than that for us. People hear that. Oh, you're not one of those who believes in easy believism. What is it, hard believism? See, most people who say that believe you have to do good works to get to heaven. I got news for you, friend. You're not going to heaven if that's what you believe. 
You don't go to heaven by your works. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to give you everlasting life if you'll trust in Christ. Now, getting back to, to Ephesians 5, Jesus is the perfect picture of the perfect husband. A man is to love his wife as Christ loved the church in obedience to God's command at all times and sacrificially. Guys, you know what that means? That means that you will and you are willing to and you will take pleasure in giving up at times something for the sake of your wife. Okay? Now, the fishing opener was last week, right? Am I right? Is it today? Next week, okay. Well, you know what? Praise the Lord that we don't have it on Mother's Day this week. Um, this year, sorry, this year. Praise the Lord for that. Usually here in Minnesota, it's on Mother's Day. Out of all the idi idiotic, ignoramus things anybody could ever do. Now, there may be some wives who want to spend the day, you know, getting up at 3 in the morning and going on into the lake. And the husband's there. Hey, it doesn't get any better than this. And she's there. Yeah, uh, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Are the fish still going to be there a week after? Yeah, a lot of them are still going to be there. Get a life. Keep your wife. <laughs> Sounds like a bumper sticker, doesn't it? Huh? Sacrificially, sacrificially, give, it, give something up. Is that not something simple to give up, by the way, if that would be the need? Okay. So he's to do in obedience to God's command at all times, sacrificially, and forth, he is to give of his time and attention. And attention. I see that in verses 26 and 27. See, we, the church and the bride of Christ, are the focus of our Lord Jesus Christ. In life relationships, the wife is to be the primary focus of the husband. Did you know that? Not the kids, not the buddies. Not the co-workers, not the hobby, your wife, your wife. It's like, Ugh. Boy, never heard that. Tell you what, things will go better if you start thinking that way. Sacrifice, if need be, for your wife. Okay, Jesus does that for us. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Who has the responsibility in, in the spiritual realm? Who has the responsibility of purifying the church? The Lord does, right? Who has the responsibility of encouraging the wife on in spiritual growth and Christian growth? And purity of life. The husband does. That means spiritual leadership in the home. Now again, remember, God is there, guys, to help us. Because we don't come into this world understanding it and knowing it automatically. We just don't. Give of your time and attention. One smart woman said this, an archaeologist is the best husband a woman can have. The older she gets, the more interested he is in her. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Okay? They too shall be one 
flesh. Men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. What is that talking about? You're one. When you get married, you're one. If you do good to your wife, you're doing good to yourself. If you do bad to your wife, you're doing bad to yourself. If there's ever a place where sowing and reaping takes place, it's in the marriage relationship. So let me just close very quickly. We're over time, but let me just close with this. So what if you're a child here today on Mother's Day and you wonder where you fit into this? Well, we're going to talk probably more about that next time, but listen. Actually, we will. Listen. Very simple today, which is our closing point. Children are to honor their parents in all things. If you are still at home, children are to honor and obey your parents in all things. In all things? In all things. What does that include? You tell me. What does all mean? I think we can all get that, right? Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. You want your life to be blessed? Obey. Ephesians 6 says, children, honor your parents. That means to esteem them highly, to consider them as valuable and precious. That's how you're to treat your parents. Listen, you better, you need to treat your mom that way today. And by the way, not just today. Okay, it's midnight. I I can quit honoring her. You're missing the point. You get it. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.